Welcome to Storm Along by Mary Hope Osborne, illustrated by Greg Newbold. Remember to follow along in your journey's textbook. One day in the early 1800s, a tidal wave crashed down on the shores of Cape Cod in New England. After the wave had washed back out to sea, the villagers heard deep bellowing sounds coming from the beach. When they rushed to find out what was going on, they couldn't believe their eyes. A giant baby, three fathoms tall, or 18 feet, was crawling across the sand, crying in a voice as loud as a foghorn. The villagers put the baby in a big wheelbarrow and carried him to town. They took him to the meeting house and fed him barrels and barrels of milk. As ten people patted the baby on the back, the minister said, What will we name him? How about Alfred Bulltop Stormalong? A little boy piped up, and we can call him Stormy for short. The baby smiled at the boy. Stormy it is, everyone cried. As he grew older, Stormy was the main attraction of Cape Cod. He didn't care for all the attention, however. It reminded him that he was different from everyone else. After school, he always tried to slip away to the sea. He liked to swim into the deep water and ride the whales and porpoises. Stormy's love for the ocean was so strong that folks used to say he had salt water in his veins. By the time Stormy was 12, he was already six fathoms tall or 36 feet. I guess you're going to have to go on into the world now, his friend said sadly. The truth is you've grown too big for this town. You can't fit in the schoolhouse and you're too tall to work in a store. Maybe you should go to Boston. It's a lot bigger than Cape Cod. Stormy felt like an outcast as he packed his trunk, hoisted it over his shoulder, and started away. And when he arrived in Boston, he discovered something that made him even sadder. Although the city had more buildings than Cape Cod, they were just as small. Worse than that, his huge size and foghorn voice scared the daylights out of everyone he met. A sailor's life is the only one for me he said, staring longingly at Boston Harbor. The sea's my best friend. It's with her that I belong. And with his back to Boston, Stormy strode toward the biggest Yankee clipper docked in the harbor, the Lady of the Sea. Blow me down, said the captain when Stormy stood before him. I've never seen a man as big as you before. I'm not a man, said Stormy. I'm 12 years old. Blow me down again, said the captain. I guess you'll have to be the biggest cabin boy in the world then. Welcome aboard, son. The sailors were a bit shocked when the captain introduced the 36-foot giant as their new cabin boy, but the day soon came when all the sailors of the Lady of the Sea completely accepted Stormy's awesome size. It happened one morning when the clipper was anchored off the coast of South America. Hoist the anchor, the captain shouted after a few hours of deep-sea fishing. But when the crew pulled on the great chain, nothing happened. The sailors heaved and hoed and still could not move the anchor off the bottom of the ocean. Let me take care of it, Stormy boomed. Then the captain boy climbed onto the bowsprit and dived into the sea. After Stormy disappeared, terrible sounds came from the water. The ship began pitching and tossing on wild, foaming waves. It seemed that all aboard were about to be hurled to a wet grave when suddenly the sea grew calm again, and Stormy bobbed to the surface. Hand over hand, he climbed the anchor chain, nearly pulling the ship onto her side with his great weight. As soon as he was safely aboard, he yanked up the anchor, and once again, Lady of the Sea began to glide through the ocean. What happened? cried the crew. Just a little fight with the two-tone octopus, said Stormy. Octopus? Aye, he didn't want to let go of our anchor. What'd you do to him? The others cried. Wrestled eight slimy tentacles into double knots. It'll take a month of Sundays for him to untie himself. From then on, Stormy was the most popular sailor on board. Over the next few years, his reputation spread too, until all the Yankee Clipper crews wanted him to sail with them. But Stormy still wasn't happy. Partly it was because of no ship, because no ship, not even the Lady of the Sea, was big enough for him. She would nearly tip over when he stood close to her rail. All her wood peeled off when he scrubbed her decks, and giant waves rolled over her sides when he sang a sea chanty. Worst of all, Stormy was still lonely. The clipper's hammocks were so small that at night he had to sleep by himself in a rowboat. 
As he listened to the other sailors singing and having a good time, he felt as if his best friend, the sea, had betrayed him. Maybe it was time for the giant sailor to move on. One day, when the Lady of the Sea dropped anchor in Boston, Stormy announced to his friends that he'd decided to give up his seafaring life. I'm going to put an oar over my shoulder and head west, he said. I hear there's room enough for any kind of folks out there, even ones as big as me. Where will you settle down, Stormy? a sailor asked. I'm going to walk till the first person asks me, Hey, mister, what's that funny thing you got on your shoulder there? Then I'll know I'm far enough away from the sea, and I won't ever have to think about her again. Stormy walked through the cities of Providence and New York. He walked through the Pine Barrens of New Jersey and the woods of Pennsylvania. He crossed the Allegheny Mountains and floated on flatboats down the Ohio River. Pioneers often invited Stormy to share their dinner, but these occasions only made him homesick, for folks always guessed he was a sailor and asked him questions about the sea. It wasn't until Stormy came to the plains of Kansas that a farmer said, Hey, mister, what's that funny thing you got on your shoulder? You asked the right question, mate, said Stormy. I'm going to settle down on this spot and dig me some potatoes. And that's just what Stormy did. Soon he became the best farmer around. He planted over five million potatoes and watered his whole crop with the sweat of his brow. But all the time Stormy was watering, hoeing, picking, and planting, he knew he still had not found a home. He was too big to go square dancing in the dance hall. He was too big to visit the other farmhouses too big for the meeting house, too big for the general store. And he felt a great yearning for the sea. He missed the fish-smelling breezes and salt spray. Never in the prairies did a giant wave knock him to his knees. Never did a hurricane whirl him across the earth. How could he ever test his true strength and courage? One day, several years after Stormy's disappearance, the sailors of Boston Harbor saw a giant coming down the wharf, waving his oar above his head. As he approached, they began to whoop with joy. Stormy was back. But as happy as they were to see him, they were horrified when they discovered how bad he looked. He was all stooped over, his face was like a withered cornstalk, and there were pale bags under his eyes. After word spread about Stormy's condition, thousands of sailors met to talk about the problem. We've got to keep him with us this time, one said. There's only one way to do it, said another. Build a ship that's big enough. Aye, the others agreed. We can't have him trail behind us at night in his own rowboat. So the New England sailors set about building the biggest clipper in the world. Her sails had to be cut and sewn in the Mojave Desert, and after she was built, there was a lumber shortage all over America. It took over 40 seamen to manage her pilot's wheel, unless, of course, the captain happened to be Alfred Fulltop Stormalong, who could whirl the ship's wheel with his baby finger. Stormalong named the clipper the Courser. On her maiden voyage, he clutched the courser's wheel and steered her out of Boston Harbor. As he soared over the billowing waves, his cheeks glowed with sunburn, his hair sparkled with ocean spray, and the salt water began coursing through his veins again. Soon Stormy and the courser were taking cargoes all over the world, to India, China, and Europe. It took four weeks to get all hands on deck. Teams of white horses carried sailors from stem to stern. The ship's towering mass had to be hinged to let the sun and moon go by. The tips of the masts were padded so they wouldn't punch holes in the sky. The trip to the crow's nest took so long, the sailors who climbed to the top returned with gray beards. The vessel was so big that once, when she hit an island in the Caribbean Sea, she knocked it clear into the Gulf of Mexico. But one of the courser's most memorable escapades took place in the English Channel. When she was trying to sail between Calais and the dark cliffs of Dover, her crew discovered that the width of her beam was wider than the passageway. It's impossible to wedge her through, the first mate cried. We have to turn back. Hurry before she crashes on the rocks, said another. No, don't turn her back, bellowed Stormy from the captain's wheel. Bring all the soap on deck. The crew thought Stormy had lost his mind, but they went below and hauled up the three-ton shipment of soap just picked up in Holland. Now swab her sides until she's as slippery as an eel, Stormy ordered. Aye, the sailors shouted and they sang a chanty as they plastered the courser's sides with white soap. Now we'll take her through, said Stormy, and the ship's sails caught the wind. Stormalong eased her between the Dover Cliffs and Calais. Ever since then, the white cliffs of Dover have been as milky white as a whale's belly, and the sea below still foams with soap suds. For years, Stormalong was the most famous sea captain in the world. 
Sailors in every port told how he ate ostrich eggs for breakfast, a hundred gallons of whale soup for lunch, and a warehouse full of shark meat for dinner. They told how after every meal he'd pick his teeth with an eighteen-foot oar. Some said it was the same oar he once carried to Kansas. But it was also said that sometimes when the crew sang chanties late at night, their giant captain would stand alone on deck, gazing out at the sea with a look of unfathomable sorrow in his eyes. After the Civil War, steamships began to transport cargo over the seas. The days of the great sailing ships came to an end, and the courageous men who steered the beautiful Yankee clippers across the ocean also began to disappear. No one remembers quite how old Stormalong died. All they recollect is his funeral. It seems that one foggy twilight, thousands of sailors attended his burial. They covered him with a hundred yards of the finest Chinese silk, and then fifty sailors carried his huge coffin to a grave near the sea. As they dug into the sand with silver spades and lowered his coffin with a silver cord, they wept tears like rain. And for years afterward, they sang a song about him. Old Stormy's dead and gone to rest. To my way, hey, storm along. Of all the sailors, he was the best. Ay, 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 Mr. Storm along. Ever since then, the seamen first class put A-B-S after their names. Most people think it means able-bodied seamen. But the old New England seafaring men know different. They know that it stands for the most amazing deep-water sailor who ever lived, Alfred Bulltop Stormalong. <laughs>